Okay, so thank you for the invitation. Um, so this is a work uh, at the intersection of, um, I guess, control optimization, machine learning, generative modeling. Um, and, you know, it's a couple of years old, but I'm still, you know, very proud of this work because it, that was maybe the first one to, to kind of uh, characterize the expressive capabilities of uh, diffusion processes when you use them as generative models. Um, so the work um, is with Belinda Tsen, who's actually my uh, uh, PhD student. This is her final year in the computer science department. Um, okay, so let's see here. So we're going to talk about deep generative models, but in general, with a generative model, we have um, a stochastic relationship between two random objects. We have a latent variable x that sort of you know works behind the scenes to generate all the randomness, and then conditionally on that we generate an observed variable y. And here the idea is that um, y is really what you care about, um, and the relationship between x and y is some sort of a mechanism to um, um, to model um, the samples from Y or to generate the samples from Y. So, right, I mean, if you formulate it this way, it, it looks not very interesting. So, so let's make it interesting. So the idea is to go to uh, deep generative models. Um, of course, this is the term that everybody uses, but uh, you, know, you can also think about them as time and homogeneous Markov chains. So here the idea is that you still have the situation where um, your goal is to get a sample from Y, um, but you build up the internal randomness successively in stages. So the idea is that um, your Y is determined by, um, let's say the final iterate in a long Markov chain, right? So you start with some initial uh, X naught, draw it from some distribution, and then you do it in stages. So you generate the latent randomness First, you generate x1 conditionally on x0. Then you generate x2 conditionally on x1. x0 is no longer um, in the picture, et cetera. And you keep going. At the end of k stages of this process, you then sample your uh, observed variable y from, from some uh, observation model. So why um, is this even used? Well, here, here the idea is that you can build up a lot of complicated uh, latent objects compositionally, right? So Simplest case would be something like a Gaussian um, latent model where the conditional distribution of, let's say, the ith stage of the latent process given the previous one is Gaussian, but the mean and the covariance functions are both uh, nonlinear functions of, uh, of the previous iterate, right? So you, can, um, so you can do it this way. There are some parameters. And then the idea is that if you now want to flexibly combine these models, you can choose the mean and the covariance functions from some uh, nice function class that you can parameterize, perform all sorts of automatic differentiation, et cetera. Uh, and so here the idea is that the sampling process should be broken down into a series of manageable steps. And uh, then you can represent various things like maybe uh, computing log likelihoods, et cetera, as you know, the usual computation graphs that one sees an automatic differentiation. And this idea, of course, was uh, uh, pointed out by a number of uh, researchers more or less independently at about more, about more or less about the same time. But you know, one nice representative paper is this work by uh, Daniela Rosende et al from um, 2014 on stochastic backpropagation, where this uh, precise idea was, uh, was used to say, okay, now we can actually perform inference and sampling using, uh, you know, the same techniques that you would use to compute gradients in um, layered models, right? So we're interested in the situation where the number of these iterates is very large, um, but the sort of variance or the step size, if you will, is uh, adjusted accordingly, right? So imagine now that you have a, a deep Gaussian model like this, right? So Gaussian here refers to the fact that the conditional distribution of the activation of each layer, let's use the neural net terminology, uh, given the activation of previous layer is Gaussian, but with the mean and covariance determined nonlinearly. Here I'm using um, spherical Gaussians. So the nonlinearity is pushed off to the mean, right? So what I do is I generate uh, an infinite sequence of IID standard normals, and this is gonna be my randomness. 
Uh, the other source source of randomness is let's say the um, the initial point, but here I'm going to make it deterministic. So the initial point is deterministic. Then you keep adding Gaussians um, and also shifting the mean according to some nonlinear function of the previous observation. Notice the scaling with a step size eta, right? So so the the mean shift is proportional to eta, and the additional noise, uh, the variance is also proportional to eta. Right, and then you do this for k steps, and then you sample your observed variable y according to your observation mechanism. So I'm interested in a situation where, um, let's say, you take the number of layers k to infinity, and you make the step size eta inversely proportional to k. Right, so in that limit, you can you know use the theory of weak convergence or you know uh, many other approaches to show that you're going to end up with a continuous time process in latent space, right? So your latent space is, let's say, RD, you're going to end up with a diffusion process, right? So this is how you canonically build up diffusion processes by specifying what one would call drift and, uh, uh, and diffusion coefficients, right? So the idea is that basically you take infinitesimally small Gaussian steps where um, here I'm using spherical covariance, which is also scaled down by eta, and the mean is a nonlinear function of your previous position. So the sum um, becomes an integral, and uh, you're adding a Wiener process on top of that. So here, WT is a standard Wiener process. By now, stochastic calculus is more or less mainstream in in uh, NML, so I don't think I need to dwell too much uh, dwell too much on uh, on the theory of uh, uh, diffusion processes. But the main upshot here is that you have a continuous time process uh, described by uh, a drift function, and here the drift function B depends on the current position of the process. And we assume that it comes from some parameterized class of functions, right? Here I'm using unit diffusion matrix. So, so the noise is just superimposed on top of that. And then you run this for, um, let's say unit time, because you know the way, you've, the way we've scaled things is that the number of layers is K. Each layer uh, corresponds to a time step of uh, length eta, set eta to be one over K. So by the time you're done, uh, one unit of time elapsed. And uh, you know, I, I'm not claiming by any means that diffusion processes uh, have not been used previously as generative models. In fact, of course, they have. So you know, there are lots of works where um, effectively what you have is something like an RNN, um, a recurrent neural net with an additional noise in continuous time is used to generate some sort of a process of interest. Um, what I will be interested in is. Um, um, you know, questions related to expressivity and uh, sampling in these models. So let's look at some, uh, th this is just some related work um, that, um, that inspired this. So, you know, continuous time limits of adaptive stochastic algorithms that, you know, uh, is, is a, a very fruitful line of research because in general calculus is uh, um, just much easier to work with than, you know, than discrete recursions, at least in my, uh, uh, you know, opinion, which is of course why I'm in an ECE department as opposed to a computer science department where I might have, you know, the opposite opinion. Uh, clearly this, you know, this idea that, um, you know, you, you, can, you can consider deterministic neural nets in continuous time. So that's uh, neural ODEs, uh, you know, the, 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 the paper by uh, Ricky Chen et al. Uh, has made a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of noise and reverberation in the deep learning community. But the idea of using continuous time neural nets uh, and analyzing their behavior uh, is, is fairly old. I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful paper by Morris Hirsch, who's, you know, a mathematician analyzing um, dynamics of continuous time neural nets. And then, um, of course, you know, once you add stochasticity, you end up with something like a recurrent neural net in continuous time. And once again, there's a, there's a lot of work. Uh, for example, Eugene Wong had an interesting idea for using something like um, stochastic hop field nets to solve optimization problems. And, uh, uh, you know, other workers have picked up on this, maybe in the context of, let's say, neuroscience or signal processing, or later in the context of modeling um, you know, things like financial, um, you know, uh, financial instruments or uh, ecological monitoring. The point is that by now, this work on uh, using stochastic differential equations as models of processes that you can, you know, fit the data 
is a more or less established and, and respectable line of work. And when we wrote this paper, like I said, in, in, in 2019, um, to the best of my knowledge, this was really the first one to ask a question, well, how expressive can these things be in some sort of a quanti quantifiable sense? Um, right, so, so basically we're looking at these deep uh, Gaussian models in the diffusion limit, and we're interested in three questions. Um, expressiveness, so, you know, how rich is the class of distributions you can sample this way? Inference, well, you know, um, can you can you uh, fit parameters to data? Let's say you observe a bunch of y's, y1 through yn. Can you fit a parameter to the corresponding latent process? And uh, simulation, right? So let's um, be a bit more precise. So by expressiveness, we mean the class of distributions that one could generate for the terminal uh, variable y. But uh, typically in generative models, the conditional um, density of y given x is given, and really all of the action is in a latent space. So here the idea is um, to characterize the richness of distributions of the terminal point x1, right? So we're running the time from, um, from 0 to 1. And so the richer the class of distributions you can generate for x1, the richer the class of distributions you can generate for y. Uh, this will be the main focus of the talk. There's also the issue of inference. So let, now suppose I'm given uh, a vector of observations, y1 through yn, I would like to uh, compute the marginal log likelihood, um, right, according to, to a given uh, parameter theta for my, for my uh, drift coefficient here. Um, I will mention this very briefly because this is not uh, really the focus of this work. Uh, but another important question is simulation. So let's suppose now I want to estimate um, expectations of various test statistics. Can I do this uh, reliably in a sense that I have an unbiased estimate with, um, with a finite variance, right? Okay. So mostly, like I said, mostly uh, I will focus on the first point. I'll briefly mention the second one. And... Uh, um, I'll discuss the third one if, uh, if, if time remains. All right, so, so this is what we're gonna see. We're gonna see how useful these generative models are in the first place. So let's suppose there are no restrictions on the drift. You can just choose it to be anything, anything you want. Can you sample from uh, any distribution uh, with sufficient regularity? Um, how expressive are these things, right? So now that, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can choose a drift without restrictions, to sample from some desired distribution. If you now back off from this and request, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, parametric class for drifts, um, can you make it rich enough, right? So let's say now your drifts are neural nets with a given depth, the given size. Um, so now you've um, restricted the class of models that you could sample uh, from. Is this restriction very significant? And finally, unbiased simulation is precisely what I mean. Now that if you can if you can uh, uh, generate sort of these things um, using neural net drifts, can you sample efficiently from them? Okay, so let's first look at uh, uh, an exact perspective, right? So let's suppose I would like to sample from some distribution. Um, generally, we can actually roll this problem uh, of both sampling and inference into uh, a unified stochastic control formulation. I'm sure, you know, I realize not everyone is familiar with, with ideas uh, of controlled diffusions, but, uh, you know, I, I really don't have enough time to do, do the subject justice. I'll try to um, provide enough intuition. So this problem starts as follows. Suppose you have some sort of a diffusion process, you can call it a reference process. So here, you know, the drift B is, is fixed. Um, uh, the diffusion coefficient is uh, just the identity matrix, right? And uh, we start at some fixed deterministic initial condition, run this for, for uh, unit time. And now um, the idea is that in principle, this diffusion process under reasonable assumptions on B, let's say it's Lipschitz, um, has well-defined transition densities, meaning that, okay, if I give you an initial point X naught, um, what's the conditional distribution of XT given, given X naught, right? So clearly here we're interested mostly in conditional distribution of the terminal point X1 given X, uh, uh, given X naught at time zero. So if I now add a drift to this diffusion, meaning that, okay, so the diffusion uh, process, 
is in some state X at position X at time T. And what I'm gonna do is pull it away from the dynamics that are, that, that are given above, right? With drift B. So I'm gonna add the drift. Clearly what's going to happen is the transition densities and therefore the stochastic nature of this process is gonna be completely different, right? By, by adding this drift, you shape the distribution of this process, right? So our goal is to shape the distribution of the process in a particular way. We would like to, um, let's say we have a terminal cost, right? So this process runs for unit time, starting at some initial point X naught. At, um, after, the, uh, after this uh, uh, time horizon elapses, you incur a cost given by a negative log of some positive function G, right? So you're in some state X1, and your terminal cost is negative log G of X1. The G is given to you, uh, and we'll see later that you know, by choosing G in an appropriate way, we can cover both sampling and simulation, right? But the idea is that you would like to be in a state whose uh, expected value of you know, negative log G is small. On the other hand, you don't want to disturb the reference process too much, so you put uh, a cost associated with uh, this control effort. Right, you're adding a drift, ut, and the control cost here is precisely the, um, essentially the L2, squared L2 norm of the total drift process, right, up to a, a factor of two, right? So you're balancing essentially the um, strength of the perturbation that you add on top of your reference process against the terminal cost, which is usual sort of setup in stochastic control problems. Right, you have the stage cost, which basically says, okay, here's your state and action. You incur this much cost for taking this action in this state. And then the idea is that, um, you know, once you're done, you look at the terminal cost, which, which corresponds to, you know, landing in some desirable state. Right, so here, the, by the way, the state action cost only depends on the action. Okay, so these types of processes are, you know, well studied. And you know, there's there's really nothing new here, but uh, um, we will see that this result synthesizes both sampling and inference. But for now, let's let's treat this as as some sort of an abstract problem, right? So G is given to us, and the terminal cost here in the previous slide is negative log G. The control cost is half uh, squared L two norm of of the of the control. It turns out that you can actually characterize the minimum total control cost. Right, overall possible drifts in terms of just the reference diffusion process. And it turns out that that's the negative log of, of, of the conditional expectation of G of X1, the terminal cost, um, given the initial point. Notice that in the control formulation, the expectation here is uh, outside, right, right here, and the negative log is inside. Uh, and it turns out that the optimal value, the minimum value of the control, the negative log is outside the expectation. And what you're doing is computing the expected value of G of X1 conditionally on the initial point with respect to the reference process. So this is the best you can do. And the optimal control is given explicitly by negative gradient with respect to X of a certain function V of XT. If you've seen uh, Bellman's equation in uh, continuous time optimal control, you will not be surprised to see this, that this V is actually the value function for this stochastic control problem once you set up, set up your dynamic program in continuous time. But in fact, V has a very specific expression. V is exactly, so here the idea is that V um, is the cost to go, right? So the idea is, let's suppose that you've been controlling this process uh, up to time little t, and at time little t, you're at some point x. You still have some, some ways to go. And uh, here you do something like negative log of the conditional expectation of x1, given the, uh, where you are at x little t. Notice that, uh, that of course, uh, v of x0, as you would expect from the usual dynamic programming considerations, is exactly the value of the optimal cost. Like I said, there's really nothing um, you know, nothing that uh, complicated here. In fact, uh, this is a synthesis of uh, uh, a couple of papers, one by Michele Pavon and the other one is uh, uh, by Paolo Daipra. Both were, uh, both were uh, really concerned with just the sampling. But um, the only thing that we did add on top of this is uh, an explicit formulation of a control problem involving a precise control cost and a terminal cost. And, you know, in existing works, 
it was just noted that you know certain transition densities, if you m manipulate them just right, uh, you end up with a PDE that looks like a Bellman, Bellman equation. So you kind of uh, import some of the properties of the solution of the Bellman equation without really sort of um, touching upon, you could say, sort of the semantics of, of, of control. Whereas you know in our work, we actually attempted to do exactly that. Um, and the proof is not very uh, uh, not very complicated, but here you know it relies on two inequivalent, but you know complementary probabilistic representations of uh, of conditional expectations, either um, through um, what's called the Feynman Cotts formula. So the idea is that you 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 write down this conditional expectation v v uh, this v of x t x and t it satisfies a certain PDE, and there's a known result in the theory of uh, diffusions that you know solutions of these PDEs can be expressed probabilistically. And the other one is um, what's called Fleming's logarithmic transformation, where it turns out that once you write down the control problem, right, you, you, you do the dynamic program, you end up with a Bellman's equation, which is a, a nonlinear PDE, right? So nonlinear meaning it's, it's, it's not, a, so the right-hand side of the PDE, so you typically have something like partial derivative of V with respect to T is equal to some linear differential operator of V. Uh, acting on V with respect to space, right? That's that's a linear PDE. Uh, nonlinear PDE is the one where this operator is nonlinear. I'm not going to go into too much, but you know, it's 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 described in in um, in our paper, which I'll re reference at the end. But here, you know, the, the the more important thing is really to think about what what this means uh, in some probabilistic sense. So every time you add a drift, you, as I said. Um, affect the distribution of the process, right? Your process is a random, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, the process generates a random path, right? A random function uh, that maps points in the unit interval, your times to points in RD, right? If you don't add a control, there's a certain process that we, we, we call P naught. So P naught is, is the probability law of, you know, this measure over um, over functions, and in fact, for diffusion processes, these functions are continuous with probability one. When you add a drift u, you change this probability law. Um, these two distributions, in fact, we can write down the KL divergence between them. So there's a wonderful result in stochastic calculus saying that essentially any two diffusion processes that only differ by a change of drift. Are absolute, their measures are absolutely continuous with respect to one another. One can, in fact, write down the log likelihood ratio, the you know, log of the Radon negative derivative, uh, as, as a certain uh, martingale. And then um, you can compute the expectation of that that gives you KL divergence. The KL divergence is exactly the expected value of the control cost that you need in order to uh, essentially steer P naught away towards PU. Right, and this means that now we can define a free energy. The free energy is, is the following thing. So any drift U will cost you the effort to move you know, from the nominal dynamics P naught into the one controlled by U. And then of course, from that, this is the entropy contribution. And then the energy contribution comes from uh, the expected terminal cost. And the control formulation basically tells you that the minimum control cost is the minimum free energy, and that's equal to negative log of this expected value of G conditionally on the, uh, on the starting point. Right, so, so once you realize this, then, then of course you can you know, play the usual game. You notice on the right-hand side, you have minimum of the free energy over all possible drifts U. So you, know, you can always upper bound this by choosing, by minimizing instead over some sub collection of drifts. Let's say maybe the ones that are representable by neural nets with you know this many neurons, or you know like constrain them by width or depth or or what have you, right? And any such, and 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 so then the idea would be that you choose such a collection of suboptimal drifts to you know to satisfy maybe some tractability considerations, but of course you give up optimality, right? Okay, um, so let me uh, then show you how this theorem gives you two uh, useful results. One is the Filmer drift. So this goes back to a very, very classic problem that in some sense was posed by um, uh, Erwin Schrodinger in 1930s. And he was concerned with, you know, foundations of uh, physics. You know, he was, you know, he was curious about the extent to which you can use empirical observations to, you know, to, to, to explain um, 
to possibly um, discuss what, what, what sort of physical laws would be responsible for them. So he considered basically a bunch of particles. Let's say these particles are sitting at the origin at, at, at t equals zero, and then you let them go. Your null hypothesis is that these particles are diffusing, they're undergoing the usual Brownian motion, which basically means that if you now were to look at um, the empirical distribution of these particles at t equals one, that should look approximately Gaussian, right? You look at the histogram and it should have the usual, you know, spherical Gaussian shape. Now, suppose you look at that histogram and it does not look Gaussian, like maybe it has, you know, more than one mode or something like that. And the question is, what's the minimal modification to your null hypothesis that, you know, these particles are just diffusing, diffusing according to the usual heat equation um, to explain this? And, and essentially the idea is, you can abstract it in the following sense. I give you a distribution mu, which is different from the standard Gaussian, right? So if uh, your null hypothesis about Brownian motion were correct, you would have a standard Gaussian. So gamma d here is a standard Gaussian in d dimensions. You see something else, you see mu. You assume it's absolutely continuous with respect to the Gaussian, which of course is fairly easy to satisfy. Both have densities, let's say. And you want to find, um, a control that you can put on top of the Brownian motion that perturbs it minimally and, it, and achieves the desired distribution at equals one. Um, so it turns out that, well, this is, like I said, this is well known, which is why, you know, for example, the name of uh, um, Hans Filmer is here. Um, so he was one of the first uh, applied mathematicians to, you know, really look at this problem rigorously. The idea is the following. Consider all possible drits that you could add to make distribution to make the distribution mu um, at the terminal time, right? There could be many such drifts. Uh, what we could say is that the expected control effort of any such process is lower bounded by the KL divergence just between the target mu and the Gaussian gamma d, and the optimal control that achieves this actually has an explicit form. It's this Fulmer drift. You see what happens here is f is the density of your mu with respect to standard Gaussian. So imagine like it has some PDF and you then multiply it by the reciprocal of the standard Gaussian, that's what you get. Um, and what you do is you, you first smooth it out using Euclidean heat semigroup. So here the idea is that F is your density of mu with respect to standard Gaussian. And what you do is you convolve that density with a Gaussian of variance T. So here you convolve it with a, with a Gaussian variance one minus T. So at t equals zero, you can evolve it with a Gaussian of full variance, and then you keep cranking that various variance down to zero as you go, right? So according to the schedule one minus t. This turns out to be the optimal solution. This is the minimum control effort. Um, and uh, you know we, we can actually derive this uh, using our formalism. Like I said, it, it you know this, this makes it. Uh, I think transparent. This, the, the result itself, the form of the optimal drift has been known for quite some time. Like I said, due to the work of Fulmer, Dipra, uh, Pavon, other people. Uh, but you know what, what I like about this derivation is that more or less just mechanically follows once you apply this theorem. So your reference diffusion is just a standard Brownian motion. So zero drift means that you, know, you, you just have uh, dx is equal to dw, right? You add a drift. Um, and then your terminal, so, you know, the, the drift costs you this integral of, you know, half, uh, um, half squared norm of ut. What is the terminal cost? Let's make the terminal cost to be negative log of that density, right? So if you were to take an expectation, it's something like cross entropy. Um, and then, you know, from here, you can more or less just use the fact that your reference process is a Brownian motion. We know it's transition probability densities. They're all Gaussian, right? Um, so, so everything here is more or less an exact computation, right? So, you know, here we use the fact that we're trying to compute conditional distribution of W1 given WT. Again, that uh, density is Gaussian with mean zero, um, or here mean X and variance one minus T, et cetera, right? So you can compute everything. And you know that the minimum cost is just negative log of the expected value of F right, for the standard Brownian motion. But remember that F is the density of mu with respect to a Gaussian. So therefore the expectation of F with respect to W1 is simply one. So that minimal cost is zero. And then of course, you know, you can easily show that for any other control, 
using data processing inequality, you get this kind of a, a representation. So like I said, it follows straightforwardly from this optimal control formulation with explicit um, control and terminal costs. Now, um, uh, quick question, Max. Um, yeah. The choice of F in the formulation, uh, like mm -hmm. you choose that to be the density, uh, but is right. that like an obvious choice or? Um, in a way, sort of in, in, in retrospect, yes, because, because here the idea is that um, you want the density, right? You, you sort of know what, what you want the density to be at, at, at t equals one. Um, in fact, I, it's, it's not obvious. You kind of have to sort of reason your way backwards to it. Uh, I recently gave a tutorial on, on this sort of thing at the Simons Institute, where in fact, I, I, I came up with a way of uh, um, extracting this kind of you know, reasoning backwards to it. So you don't need to know anything about stochastic control. You just write down two different expressions for the density uh, of the perturbed process with respect to Wiener process. One using the, the fact that you, know, you want to solve a certain minimum KL divergence problem, the other one using the full Gersonov theorem. And then you kind of, you know, use a lot of stochastic calculus to arrive at the fact that this is what you should be doing. It's not straightforward, but it is possible to, it is possible to recover that. I mean, for here, we just kind of, this was a lucky guess for us. But later, you know, I, I actually kind of understood that, 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 that you, could, you could sort of come up uh, at a, a more or less principled justification for that. Okay, okay. right, so, very briefly, now I want to talk about, uh, you know, variational inference. So now suppose you are given some sort of a generative model with a diffusion um, as your latent process. And, um, and you want to compute the log likelihood uh, of some observations according to this, right? It turns out that, well, you know, you can basically just uh, uh, upper bound this log likelihood by, by effectively the control cost, where your terminal cost is basically the total log likelihood um, and so this, uh, uh, this gives you a variational free energy. So now, um, if this computation is complicated, right, if you, if you don't want to compute this marginal density, you can, you know, use some sort of a suboptimal control, uh, to do it. And in fact, Belinda and I kind of, you know, um, um, have a preprint where we said, well, this could be the basis of basically neural SDEs, like kind of a stochastic backprop in continuous time. But now let's, uh, let's get back to this whole sampling business. Right, so far I told you that I can give you um, a target distribution mu that has a density f of, with respect to standard Gaussian, and there exists an SDE such that in finite time, it's gonna give you a sample from that distribution, right, with minimum control effort. So you can't really do better than this in terms of uh, you know, control cost. Now, um, and you could call it non-parametric because you're not restricting the drift in any way. Now suppose that, um, your family of allowable drifts was restricted, right? Let's say you could, uh, you could stick to only neural nets of a given size. Um, could you still generate a sample from some distribution that's close to mu? Let's say mu hat, such that the KL divergence between mu and mu hat is less than epsilon, right? So uh, here the interpretation would be that, you know, if you think about the universal approximation theorems for neural nets, you have a, you're given a continuous function, and, uh, and then you construct a neural net, let's say with uh, uh, you know, one hidden layer, make it large enough so that this function can be approximated in soup norm over uh, a given compact set, right? So the universal approximation theorem basically says, give me a neural network architecture, two hidden layers, uh, one hidden layer, um, sufficiently well-behaved activation function, let's say something like sigmoidal, although, you know, if you want uh, universality, you, you just choose anything that's non-polynomial and, and it's gonna work. But sigmoidal functions um, are, are nice in the sense of you know, often give you, giving you, you know, good approximation rates. This is an analog of that for distributions, right? I give you a target distribution. Can you use a neural net as a drift for an SDE? And then uh, this way obtain an approximate sample from your distribution in unit time. Notice, by the way, that this is different from uh, Langevin Mark of Chain Monte Carlo, because in Langevin, the idea is you basically have a process that, that keeps going. And the longer you run it, the closer you get to your target measure, except you never exactly hit it. You can talk about something like mixing time. So, you know, like within this time, I'm epsilon close to my target with respect to some, you know, suitable um, 
closeness criterion, like KL divergence or you know L2 Wasserstein or total variation or, or what have you. Here, the idea is to hit a given distribution exactly, or at least with an error of epsilon in finite time. And obviously, you're going to you're, you're going to you know feel the the computational limitations somewhere because you know I mean uh, sampling is fundamentally a complicated problem, so somewhere you're going to have to um, see some sacrifices. But for now, and 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 that's going to come about when you try to discretize this, of course. But for now, let's talk about, let's talk about continuous time. So here's our result. Uh, it looks long, but but basically the gist of it is is as follows. So mu is my target measure. And let's suppose that its density with respect to a Gaussian satisfies a couple of conditions. First of all, it, um, you know, it, it's it's well behaved in the sense that um, it's Lipschitz and its gradient is Lipschitz, and both are and and f is bounded away from zero. And this just tells us it's it's a tail condition on 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 you know on on the corresponding measure mu. But the import so this is just a technical regularity condition. The more fundamental one is that. Um, I should be able to approximate f as a function, this likelihood ratio, efficiently by a neural net of moderate size. And if I differentiate that neural net, um, the, the, the gradient of the neural net approximates the gradient of the original function um, as well. And such constructions do exist in literature. You, you can have versions of universal approximation theorems for neural nets where the goal is not to approximate just a function on a compact set, but let's say, you know, um, however many first, uh, however many derivatives it has. And, uh, and you can more or less get these constructions for, um, for free. You just define a suitable norm uh, for function and the derivatives, and you just go through a probabilistic um, method to construct the neural net. But the point is that f is just a function, right? So likelihood ratio of mu with respect to standard Gaussian. And I assume that f can be efficiently represented by a neural net. So if I wanted to compute this f at any point, I could get a decent approximation, let's say on a ball of some radius, um, with a large enough neural net. And then we show that if this is possible, then we can construct a drift for, for our SDE, which will also be a neural net whose size is going to be a uh, polynomial in, um, you know, one over epsilon, which is your, you know, uh, accuracy criterion, the dimension and various Lipschitz constants, such that if I were to use this drift, which is of course now going to depend on space and on time, but if I were to use this drift, um, for unit time, I'm going to hit a distribution which is within epsilon of the target. So the main message is here the expressiveness of the generative model um, is a consequence of uh, the fact that f, the likelihood ratio, can its, and its gradient can be efficiently approximated by neural nets. And of course, the message here is that notice that the neural net in this uh, drift its parameters or weights do not depend on time. So the neural net basically takes, you can think about it, takes two inputs. It takes a space input and it takes a time input. But the weights of that neural net are time independent functions. And therefore you can, uh, you know, if you, if you write down the log likelihood or any other functional in terms of these weights, then you have uh, basically a scalar functional and, and therefore you can use backprop, right? To, to find its gradients with respect to the weights. Assuming that you know you, you can efficiently represent the computation graph. Okay, so any questions you know like uh, about the interpretation of this as an expressiveness result? Uh, no, quick point. Uh, so yeah. So the efficient sampling, like the complexity, would depend on the uh, neural net size for uh, approximating f. Um, yeah, I mean, right, because because obviously uh, the sampling complexity is you, you generate a sample which is uh, uh, at most epsilon in KL divergence from the target, but obviously you need to, you know, at the very least solve an SDE. And the complexity of solving an SDE is going to be determined by things like, you know, stiffness of the drift, you know, Lipschitz constants, all sorts of other stuff like that. Right, but but you know, in terms of in terms of the combinatorial sort of combinatorial complexity, the size and depth of the neural nets. I mean, we can basically give precise bounds. And in terms of uh, oh, okay, so uh, so there's a question in the chat. Was uh, so that asks like, is there a construction argument for the said neural network, or is it just an existential result? No, it's a it, it's 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 a construct it, it's a construction. It's not it's not the most efficient construction, but it's an explicit construction. 
Okay. Which which I'm going to give in a moment. Okay. So so I'm going to sketch the proof. I mean, I, I really can't can't do it full justice. But here's the idea. So so what does the exact Fulmer drift look like? It looks like this. It's a ratio. So so you know we compute this. So we, we take our function f, which is the uh, target density. We convolve it with Gaussians, right? So this involves a multidimensional integral for each t and each x. And then we differentiate that integral, and then we divide that by you know the, the, uh, divided by by that integral itself, right? Because this is, uh, this is a, a, a gradient of the log, right? So the idea is that if I can approximate both the numerator and denominator efficiently by neural nets, then you know the only operations I need to do is well, okay, so I can approximate both the numerator and the denominator by neural nets. Now I need to compute the reciprocal of the denominator, implement that efficiently by another neural net. And then I need to multiply the components of the gradient by the reciprocal of the, the denominator. So you know, once you, once you draw this as a computation graph, you sort of see what you need to do. Uh, the devil, of course, is in the details. But you know, here's the idea. First, we're going to um, replace the computation of this integral, right? Because here, the idea is that for each x and each t, I need to compute this integral. It would be good if you didn't have to recompute the integral for each x uh, and each t. You could just uh, instead basically have um, almost like a bunch of um, sampling instance, z1 through zn, and just average the value of f of x plus you know, one, you know, root 1 minus t times these z's to get an approximation to that inter in integral that will work uniformly everywhere. So basically, the idea is. We're going to use probabilistic method. We're going to choose a bunch of uh, standard Gaussians, IID. And if you use n of them, then you know that uh, with high probability, um, their norm is going to be on the order of root d log n. This is just a Gaussian maximal inequality. And then the idea is to say, OK, um, I'm going to see that with high probability, these points, if I use them as a Monte Carlo approximation to that integral, I no longer need to integrate. I just need to. Um, average a bunch of things. So this is kind of obvious, right? So, so here the idea is the following. First you, first, you approximate this Euclidean heat semigroup, this integral here, by a finite sum. These Zn's are now deterministic points, right? So, you know, so the idea is of what, 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 what high probability you can generate endpoints such that, so these points are um, at most root d log n in norm. So if I want to approximate the left-hand side uh, to a given accuracy on a ball of radius r, I need to approximate the right-hand side to the same accuracy on a ball of radius r plus root d log n, right? Because you know what I what I'm doing is I'm just uh, you know inflating this a little bit be because of this uh, maximal inequality. So now you see what's going on. You you basically uh, first approximate this this integral, this expectation, by a sum by an average while maintaining uniformity, like an X and an T, but each of these, right? So here, ZN is fixed, X is a variable, the input. Each of these Fs can be approximated by a neural net. So now what I'm doing is I take basically a bunch of subnetworks and I take the input X, I you know, shift it by these uh, uh, various, various perturbations. I send that through the corresponding neural network F hat and I sum the results. And the same thing goes for the gradient, right? I can do the same with the gradient. So as long as I can guarantee that I can do all these approximations uniformly, I'm good, right? This is the first building block. That this heat semigroup that's needed for the Fulmer drift can be itself approximated. That and its gradient can be approximated by finitely many neural nets. So, so here the idea is that if I have, notice that if I have um, a neural net of size, let's say K to approximate F, then clearly this will be approximated by a neural net of size n times k, where n is the number of these samples you draw, right? So then the idea is to choose this number n, which is polynomial and everything, such that all of these points hold, right? So you know your your uh, these perturbations zn all have bounded norm. Uh, you you have this uniform approximation of uh, of the integral by the sum, and you have uniform approximation of the gradient by the average gradient. Right, so this is kind of the you know the, the, the most complicated part of the construction, and the proof here is to kind of look at uh, 
you know an empirical process indexed by um indexed by uh basically points in a ball of radius r and by times between zero and one and then you know it's the usual thing. You need a suitable version of Talagrand's tail inequality to, to basically show that the probability of each of these events uh, is like at least one minus delta or whatever, right? And then just by the union bound, you can generate the point Z1 through Zn such that all of these hold, right? So that's basically the idea. Uh, and once you have that, the rest is, uh, you know, fairly straightforward. You, um, you know, so you have, um, F hat is a neural net. The average of F hats is a neural net. And therefore you can compute its gradient. So neural net is basically a computation graph. Therefore I can compute the gradient with respect to F by another neural net whose size is comparable to that of, of F hat. This is, you know, this is just backprop literally implemented as a computation graph. Uh, and then, you know, right. So this is the notion of the chief gradient principle. Uh, and then you, like I said, you need arithmetic operations. You need to compute this fraction Basically, you need, to multi you need multiplication, you need reciprocals, which you can, uh, you know, which you can efficiently implement. And then you need to also clip the result to uh, finite value outside a ball of radius R. And then you can do with just a uh, uh, constant number of ReLUs. So, you know, so you use some sort of activation function plus ReLU to do this. And once you do it, you know, the, the result is uh, simple. Basically, give me your radius R. For that radius, I can construct a neural net with manageable size, such that the former drift B star can be approximated by this neural net uniformly in time and over all vectors of norm no more than R, up to the root epsilon, right? And then the KL divergence between mu and mu hat, now you basically have two SDEs that differ only in the drifts. You have exact drift B star and you have the approximation B hat, you split the integral according to whether you're in a ball of radius R or not. In a ball of radius R, you have this inequality that holds. So you have epsilon here um, times one half. And outside the ball of radius R, remember that the Fulmer drift is bounded and B hat is forced to be bounded inside the ball by clipping it, right? So, so the second term is bounded. And therefore we know that um, this diffusion process will not will you know will stray outside of ball radius r with probability that decays is one over r. When you just make r large enough to make the second term less than or equal to epsilon and you're basically done. So yes, I mean this is constructive, but uh, you know the, the construction is most likely not optimal. But 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 it's not an existential result. You only assume the existence of an efficient uh, neural net representation for f. But you know once you have such a neural net representation you basically use it as a building block to construct um, an approximation to uh, to the Fulmer drift. Okay, so so this concludes that part, and I have a short part about uh, discretization. So um, I mean, I've been talking for forty eight minutes, but uh, you know, maybe uh, if if I can talk for maybe another another uh, no more than ten, I can tell you about discretization. Otherwise, we can just it's up to you. We can you know stop here. Uh I would prefer going on, like I want okay. to know about the discretization. Yeah. All right. So, um, all right. So so far, I told you that you know if if you if you have an SDE solver that run, you know solves these things in continuous time, then you can do this. Um, of course, you know what about finite resources like using discrete time, um, right? So so here's the problem. Let's suppose I have a test statistic that depends on both both on the, the you know most recent terminal point. Uh, x1 and then y, and I want to approximate its expectation, right? Um, in principle, I you know I, I can just um, I, I want this thing to be efficiently computable. I want this unbiased. And I want a finite variance estimate, um, and of course I can just you know use uh, I can average away y, and that means that really this problem is um, um, about approximating expectations of functions of x1. Okay, so the first attempt is the following. You just use the Euler scheme, which is the you know the the most basic way of solving uh, SDEs approximately. So you choose some sort of a mesh, um, you know, partition of your uh, unit time interval, and then you represent your your Gaussian by kind of a piecewise uh, linear approximation. Your your SDE this way, right? So you know you um, 
you update steps, you know, so this is the drift, and then you add a Gaussian increments of the linear process according to the mesh. Uh, and it's nice and efficient, but, uh, um, and, you, and, and you basically estimate your V by, you know, G of X one hat. The problem is that's biased. So in general, you know, you're going to incur a bias that depends on the resolution of the mesh. Um, and as a result, so, you know, what's the problem here? The thing is that if you want to uh, improve the performance of your estimate, you would need to run multiple independent copies of this, right? So basically just get multiple independent copies of, of your Brownian motion, average the results. And because of the bias, the variance is not going to scale as one over N. It's going to scale as something worse, like one over one, one to N, uh, one over N to power, power one minus delta. Right, so that means that you're not you're you're not going to get the usual Monte Carlo rates, the usual you know central limit theorem type uh, type rates. So what to do? Um, so uh, the problem of unbiased simulation of diffusions was actually considered in the literature on math mathematical finance, and uh, and um, there was a paper by uh, researchers in mathematical finance where they said, okay, but um, why do we use a deterministic Euler scheme? We can use a random mesh, right? And we just generalized it because we noticed that, you know, like their scheme suffered from some, you know, inefficiencies. But here's the basic idea. Um, collect a bunch of IID random variables that are non-negative, um, such that each of them has support outside the unit interval. And think about these as, uh, think about, uh, um, you know, what's known as a renewal process. So you basically have time, you know, so, so tau, tau one, tau two, et cetera, are the lengths of time that elapse between successive renewals. The classic example is a Poisson process. But the point is that the renewals occurred at times TK, where TK is the cumulative sum of the first K taus. And then you cut it off at, at, at T equals one, right? Because your, your, your simulation interval is, is the unit interval. And now you're going to consider uh, this um, the Euler scheme where instead of a, a deterministic mesh, you use the renewal points as mesh points. So um, the interpretation here is that you can think about this now as a deep generative model with n layers, where well, the number of layers is actually random, right? It's determined. So you know originally uh, the sources of randomness are basically your renewal interrenewal times and the standard Gaussians. Right, the interrenewal times are used to uh, basically give you the update from layer to layer, and the number of layers is now random because the number of points that hit and, that fall inside the unit interval is is random. Um, and because of this, using this, you can actually construct an estimator that has a fairly explicit form. Um, it doesn't look pretty, unfortunately. I mean, you have to do all sorts of um, you know, this is the dark arts of uh, stochastic simulation. There's, you know, you have to use a control variant and, you know, important sampling, all sorts of other nasty stuff. Uh, but the main thing is that this is, uh, you know, explicitly computable and you just have to know the PDF and the CDF of tau. And with this, we can, you know, prove the following. Suppose that G, which is your test statistic, is Lipschitz and a drift is Lipschitz in X and Holder one half in T. And if you notice, remember that we had uh, our drift was like uh, Lipschitz in X and Lipschitz in 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 uh, um, root one minus T. But you know Lipschitz in the root is the same thing as Holder half. And then uh, we can show that this estimator on top is unbiased, and the variance is finite, and it's equal to the following thing. So n is the number of renewals that fall inside the unit interval. It's a random variable and it has a moment generating function. You evaluate that moment generating function at the log of the dimension. And this is the upper bound on the variance. Um, so, so far so good, right? I mean, log of the dimension. Um, however, that's a problem. So, as I said, the variance of the estimate is controlled by the moment generating function of the number of renewals. Right, so and and we know that uh, that actually is determined by the tails of the partial sums, of of the interrenewal times. Um, well, so there's there's a like I said, the paper that inspired this is a paper by uh, Henri Labardier et al., where they used a very specific scheme. Their interarrival times were uh, exponential random variables, 
with Lambda tuned just the right way. So your renewal process is a Poisson process, right? We know that the you know, Poisson process is the one where the inter-renewal times are IID exponentially distributed, right? And so, um, well, N is Poisson with parameter Lambda, the number of arrivals. Um, and the, and this is the problem, right? The moment generating function of a Poisson random variable um, is doubly exponential in theta. So therefore, you know, so, so here, if, if your theta is log D, you have E to the D. So the variance of the Henri Labardier version where the, you know, the, the, the mesh points of the euler maroyama scheme are generated according to a standard Poisson process is exponential in dimension. And I don't think you can do much better than that. Um, what we could do is, well, there's no need to take exponentially distributed inter-arrival times. Why don't you take sub-Gaussian ones? Let's say we take uniformly distributed ones on an interval of zero uh, of length t, which is slightly larger than one. And you can show that uh, the variance of uh, uh, v hat is actually quasi polynomial in d. So it's um, it's uh, basically exponential in some polylog function of d. You still it's still you know it's obviously there's no free lunch, but it's at least better than exponential in d. Um, I wouldn't say that this method is practical. But on the other hand, it does show that you know it is possible to construct schemes that are unbiased and have finite variance that does not scale terribly with dimension. And uh, as I said, this work is from a, from uh, you know a couple couple of years ago, but uh, you know I still have good feelings about it. So uh, you can find the the full version in Colt 2019. And um, uh, with that, I'll uh, stop. Thanks.